Hold on, babe. Is the sound bars okay on that? Okay. Well, if you have your Bibles, I'd like to invite you to turn with me to uh, 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. And we're going to talk about today the three responses to the resurrection. How do you respond when you hear the word Easter? A lot of people respond... Uh, more today in some of the Christian circles, they respond, unfortunately, more negatively. I remember that, to me, Easter was about going to church and to uh, worship and to sing about the fact that Jesus rose from the dead, Right? I, uh, I went to a Lutheran school for nine years from kindergarten all the way up to uh, eighth grade. So I knew all about the Holy Week and um, about uh, the importance of, of Easter and Lent and all that kind of stuff. And to me, it was a very much a part of my life. And uh, I remember that every on Easter, we would go down to see my grandma and go to church at her church, and uh, then afterwards we would eat and and uh, do Easter eggs and all sorts of stuff. And and then when I got into college and I moved away and I uh, went to Colorado Springs, I encountered a gentleman when I worked at Target who was very much against all that stuff. He says that's pagan. That's that's uh, that's bad. That's evil. You know, we just need to not celebrate it at all. Uh, and he didn't celebrate Christmas, he didn't celebrate Easter, because that was all satanic and evil and bad and all sorts of stuff. And um, we usually respond in the, in the world, there's uh, this not on the screen, but we have three natural responses to, to the concept of Easter. Number one, we ignore it. We don't do anything about it. We just, uh, it's not real, it's evil, it's awful, it's bad. It's a pagan holiday. Well, I thank God that the church tried to make something good out of something that was bad. I do agree that Easter in its origins was not good. It's, it's not good at all. But the church wanted to make something good out of something that was bad. And so they decided that instead of worshiping a God of fertility, we were going to worship the living and true God who raised from the dead. I give them kudos for that, right? But we can choose to ignore it. Another one that we can do is we can choose to not believe it. Unbelief. And say, well, Jesus didn't really raise from the dead. In fact, if you remember in the book of Matthew that um, they didn't even believe that Jesus raised from the dead. They were spreading a rumor, right, that Jesus' disciples got a, in the middle of the night and stole his body. Right? They stole his body. And they, they spread that rumor all throughout the, the, the area. So unbelief. He didn't really raise from the dead. Or some people say, well, it's not real. It's not. He didn't really raise from the dead. He only raised spiritually in your heart. Really? That, that's about as bad as saying he didn't raise at all. <laughs> he really did raise from the dead. And the other one is doubt. Well, I don't know. He could have raised, he could not, I, I just don't know. So we can ignore it, we can unbelief, and we can have doubt. Well, today I want to give you the question is, so what is the believer's response to the resurrection? How should we as believers respond to the resurrection of Jesus? And I think that we can find it in this, uh, this third verse of, of uh, 1 Peter chapter 1. And let's look at it together. It's on the screen here, and it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope 
through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Amen? Praise God. And that is the hope. That, that's the reason why we're here. That's the reason why we come to church every Sunday. Because as we sang, He lives. Uh, I love that. Because He lives. Uh, I love that song. Uh, because He lives, I can face tomorrow. And because He lives, all fear is gone. And um, But what is the believer's response uh, to the resurrection? Well, I think there's three responses. The first one is worship. The response number one is worship. We we respond with worship. What's the first thing that, that, that Peter says here in verse 3? Look at verse 3 again. Yes. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now I underline that on the screen. Blessed. What's that word blessed mean? That word blessed means to give worth. Now, a lot of times it can be translated as happy, right? We hear the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the peacemakers, right? It can also mean someone is blessed, right? In, in Psalm 1, 1, it says, blessed is the man who does not da 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 right? And so it can mean happy, it can mean th that kind of thing. But here's what I found out as I was studying this. More often than not, when it is used in worship, it is most often used in this phrase, Blessed be the Lord. Okay? I will give you three examples in Scripture of this. I only pick three of them. If I would go through to you and show you every verse in my exhaustive concordance of all of the places, we would be here all day long. And I'm pretty sure you guys don't want to be here for me just reading Scriptures on the worship of God. But let me give you three of them. Okay, the first one is uh, David. David uh, worshipped. Look at Psalm 72 for a moment. Psalm This is what he says. Now watch this. I love this. He says, Blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel, who alone works wonders. And blessed be His glorious name forever. I think I missed something, didn't I, Josh? I missed the NLT. Yeah. I know. I'm, I'm in one of those one-track minds because I have it in my Bible here. The in the and I'll and I'll and I'll say this in 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 the NLT and I think in the NIV too, I'm not sure, but it uses the word praise. All praise be, right? Yeah, all praise. And so the word blessed can also be translated praise. That's what I want to get at here. So when it says in 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 Psalm 72, where he says, "Blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel." who alone works wonders, and blessed be His glorious name forever. And may the whole earth be filled with His glory. Amen and amen. So if we're using, and this is where it's translated as praise. So we can translate this, praise be the Lord God. The God of Israel, who alone works wonders. And praise be His glorious name forever. So the word blessed here can be translated as praise. So David praised God with the word blessed. Also, in the New Testament, in the book of Luke, the Zechariah praised God. You remember Zechariah had uh, John the Baptist, and the last time he was, uh, uh, he couldn't speak for nine months because when uh, he came and um, they asked him, uh, they and. Uh, says, you're going to give birth to a son in your old age. What did he do? He complained. He says, who am I? I'm, I'm too old. My wife's too old. And God says, because of your unbelief, you're not going to be able to speak for nine months. And so the first thing that he does when he could speak is he, he learned his lesson. He's not, going to, he's not going to be mad at God, right? He's not going to go and shake his fist and says, ah, finally I can speak, you know, 
uh, get me a Tylenol or get me an Alka-Seltzer or whatever. He learned his lesson. So what does he do instead? He praises God. See if I can find it here. Luke chapter 1, verse 68. What does he do? He opened up his mouth and he said this, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and accomplished redemption for his people. Yeah, again, that word blessed is the word praise. Praise be the Lord. So very all throughout Scripture, praise, praise, praise. Then finally, the last one is Paul. Paul went through a lot of hardship, a lot of trials, a lot of tribulations, um, a lot of things going on in his life. And instead of complaining about all the hardships, instead of complaining about all the things that were going on, this could be better, that could be better. What does he do? He praises God. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3. What does he do? Blessed, watch this, blessed praise be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, right? The Father of mercies and God of all comfort who comforts us in all of our affliction so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Again, I wanted you to see, what does he say at the beginning of verse 3? Blessed be the God and Father. Again, praise. So what is the believer's response to, to, to the resurrection? When he says here that we have been born again into a living hope through the resurrection of the uh, what does he do the first thing that he does is he prays praise God for the resurrection my friends may I ask you a very important question this morning do you worship God for his resurrection you know that Jesus was the only one that died and rose again and never died again oh yes there were other people that rose from the dead I can, show, I can share with you in the Old Testament uh, Elijah raising someone from the dead. And I can tell you in the New Testament Lazarus being raised from the dead. But they all died again. Jesus is the only one who died and raised to life again. And He's not dead. Amen. He is still alive. And our response should be that of Paul, Peter. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. All praise, praise be to Him. The second response of the believer after we worship Him is that of salvation. He goes on to say in verse 3, I have it on the screen there. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His great mercy has caused us to be born again. Now let me stop there. Who has caused us to be born again. Now what does that mean? It means that God, through His resurrection, has enabled you and I to be saved. He has caused us to be born again. Two important things to note here. Number one, our ability to be born again hinges not on our own good works, but on His mercy. Notice this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His great mercy. There is nothing that you and I can ever do to earn our own salvation. You know, I've had a lot of people come up to me over the years and they say, well, pastor, I've been a good person. <laughs> I said, really? You've been a good person. You've never broken any of the commandments. Well, you know, I've never broken the, you know, never, I've never killed anybody. Oh, really? Really, have you ever told a lie? Just, just a little one, right? We all, we've all told lies. Well, what does that make us? That makes us a liar. 
How about stolen anything? Have you ever stolen anything? Even as little bit as a, as a pen or a paper clip from your work? Well, sure. Well, according to the Bible, what does that make you? A thief. Boy, we're 0 for 2. This is the one that always got me, where Jesus says, if you look after a woman to lust after, if you've committed adultery with her in your heart, I mean, if you've done that, I've done that. 0 for 3. Now, according to God's law, we are a, we are a um, thief, we are a liar, and we are adulterers. Do you think that we could get into God's heaven on, under those convictions? I don't think so. Then how do we get into God's heaven? We get into God's heaven because of what Christ did for us on the cross. He paid the penalty of sin and death so that we don't have to. Turn with me, if you will, to the book of uh, Titus chapter 3 for a moment. This is so important that we see this. Because there are so many people today that think that they can do it themselves. That they don't need Jesus. They don't need to be saved. They don't need uh, Jesus to save them. They don't need to trust in anything because they're good people. They don't, you know, they don't, you know, kill anybody. And they're nice most of the time. And, and um, you know, but here, but here's the reality of it. It doesn't matter about that. <laughs> but in Titus chapter 3, verse 4, it says, But when the kindness of God our Savior and His love for mankind appeared, He saved us. Now watch this. Not on the basis of deeds which we have done. Notice that. We are not saved... On the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness. In fact, it says in the book of Isaiah that all of our righteousness is as tampons. May I be, may I be unclean for a moment? He says filthy rags. And actually, as it means sanitary napkins, if you want to be quite honest. He says that's what our righteousness is. That's what our best stuff that we can offer to God is filthy rags. He saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness. What? But according to His mercy. By the washing of regeneration and the renewing by the Holy Spirit whom He poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by His grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. What I wanted to see there is that we are not, ba we are not saved based on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness. Meaning that I don't get into heaven because I'm a preacher and I preach a sermon every Sunday morning. I don't get into heaven that way. I get into heaven because I trust Christ as my Savior. And I believe that He is the only one who can save me from my sins. The second thing about being born again, right? It is according to His mercy back in, in, in uh, 1 Peter. He says, according to His great mercy. The second thing is that our ability to be born again hinges on the resurrection. He has caused us to be born again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, I'm not on the third point yet, but, but this is important. He has caused us to be born again through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The fact that we are born again is all based on that fact. If Jesus did not raise, then we are not saved. If Jesus is not raised, we have no hope. If Jesus is not raised, we have not a leg to stand on. 
Let me give you some examples in Scripture. I know we're turning a lot in Scripture. That's why I have them on the screen that you can jot them down and, and go to later. But uh, one is, is uh, just a little bit later on in, in, in this same epistle, verse 23 of uh, 1 Peter 1. It says, For you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, meaning that can die, but of seed which is imperishable, meaning that has been raised to life, not to die again. That is, through the living and enduring Word of God. We've been, we've been saved because of the seed of the resurrected Jesus. And he says, all praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus caused us to be saved. The cause of our salvation is the resurrection. Yes, his death is important. But guess what? A lot of people died that way. He was, Jesus was not the only one dying the cross. Right? We saw that. There were two other guys there. Right? The thieves on the cross did not die for your sins. They both died on the cross. The only difference is that Jesus, he, yeah, he died on the cross. That's part of it. But what makes him different from everybody else is that he rose again. <laughs> Because if he would just die on the cross, he would be no better than anybody else. Peter died on the cross. But we don't look to Peter for salvation, thank heavens. We look to Jesus. Why? Because he died and on the third day he rose again. One of my favorite passages to look at during this time is, is in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If you'll turn over there for a moment. There's a, a, a few places here. We can label this chapter, 1 Corinthians 15, as the resurrection chapter. And in fact, in my Bible, it's called the resurrection chapter. And uh, this is what he says uh, according to this here. Two verses here. First one is found in verse 15. Well, two sections of verses, I should say. Verse, uh, verse 3 of, of chapter 15. For I deliver to you as first importance what I also received that Christ died for our sins, right, according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, now watch this, and that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. Now what Paul does is he emphasizes on this. Because there was this this false teaching that was going around that was saying that Jesus didn't really that Jesus didn't really raise from the dead that he raised spiritually that he did it in his body and in his heart that he's still living in his heart and Jesus says no he died he he was buried and he literally rose again the third day this isn't spiritual this is literal now look at verse 20 but now Christ has been raised literally from the dead. The first fruits of those who are asleep. Now what that means is he says he's the first of many people. The first fruits. Now the first fruits is the first crop. The first person to die. Who, those who are asleep who are dead. For since by man came death. And that's that Adam, because when Adam and Eve sinned and rebelled against God, they brought death into the world. For since by a man, Adam, came death, by a man, Jesus, also came the resurrection from the dead. Not a spiritual one, not Jesus raised in your heart, but a literal, physical resurrection from the dead to destroy the, the power that death had over us. Up until that point, we feared death. In fact, in the Old Testament, they had no understanding of death because they feared it. You and I don't have to fear death this morning. Why? Because Jesus raised from the dead and he conquered death. Right? And he's the first fruits of all who are asleep. For as in Adam, all die. So also in Christ all will be made alive. So, 
he has caused us to be born again. So we worship, we respond with giving our lives to salvation because of what he's done for us. And the third one is we have hope. The third response is hope. What is hope? Hope is positive expectation. Hope in the fact that Jesus will come again. You know, you look at the news and you look at the current events that are on and I don't know about you, but if I didn't have belief that Jesus was coming back, I would be really depressed. What's the point of living? What's the point of doing existence if the world is going to heck in a handbasket? And especially for the church today, why, why do we do church? Why do we meet even if there's five or six of us? What's the point? We do it because we have hope. We have hope in what Christ will do in the future. What will he do? He will come back again. And to that, we have hope. Verse 3 again, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope. A living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That is centered around the fact that when Jesus returns, we shall see him and we will see those who have died and gone on before us. Let me give you a few scriptures in reference to this. The first one is one of my favorite passages in John. My wife and I, we've been studying the Gospel of John in our daily Bible reading. And we, one of my favorite areas is John 14, and I don't feel worthy to, to speak on this chapter. It's more high than me but but I, I I love this verse of of the fact of of having hope and we oftentimes look at it in reference to the fact that you know Jesus will come again and or we look at it towards he is the way and the truth and the life but I always go to it when I look at the uh, the fact that uh, we can have hope um, in uncertain times the, the, the very first words out of Jesus' mouth is, it, it is that of comfort. He says in verse 1, Do not let your hearts be troubled. <laughs> this, my friends, this world can, can get awful troubling. If we're allowed to go down all the rabbit holes in life and all the news footages and especially even being overwhelmed by all of our personal problems and all of our personal pr things that are going on in our lives, we can fill our lives with anxiety and worry and fret and all sorts of things. And the first thing that Jesus tells his disciples, because they're about ready to endure the cross and they're about ready to endure Jesus going through some really difficult things. And the first thing that Jesus says is, do not let your heart be troubled. But instead, being troubled, you believe in God. Now the old edition of the NIV in the 84 and 78 uses the word trust. Trust in God, trust also in me. I like that translation better. Because the word believe here is in assistance of trust. And then he talks about that he's going somewhere. He says in verse 2, that in my father's house are many mansions or many dwelling places. And if it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. 
Now here's the hope, verse 3. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. That's the living hope that Peter was looking to. All of the apostles, if you ever noticed, always lived with a sense of urgency that Jesus could come back at any moment. Why? Because they had a living hope. They took Jesus at his words when he says that if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. <laughs> And they were waiting for that day. And I know that it's been 2,020 years since Jesus had said that, but He's still coming. And we can still have hope today. The second one is found in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter, um, chapter 4. People were being afraid that uh, the resurrection had already taken place and they'd missed out. That um, Jesus had returned and they'd missed it. And, Jesus, and Paul was trying to comfort them during this difficult time. Now what does he say? He says in verse 13. He says, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest. Now watch this. Who have no what? Hope. We have hope, right? The rest of the world doesn't have hope. We have hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, there's that key, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. Now look at verse 18. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. You know that the coming of Jesus and the idea of his second return is not meant to scare the believers. It's meant to give us comfort and hope. Why? Because we have hope. Jesus says it. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. My friend, let me ask you this this morning. How are you responding to the Easter message? How do you respond to the fact that Jesus has risen from the grave? Are you worshiping this morning? I should say, are you worshiping every day? I liked that question that the Sunday school book posed in our Sunday school time. How are you going to worship? How are you going to celebrate Easter tomorrow right because it's not just today it's every day how do we worship God how do we celebrate Easter tomorrow we worship him how do we worship God today we worship him we make sure that we're saved if you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior today is the day of salvation <laughs> if you do not know Jesus as your personal Savior and you can hear my voice Make sure that you know Jesus as your Savior. All you got to do is trust Him and believe that He can save you from your sins. 
It's all because of the resurrection that that's possible. And then finally, do you have hope? Hope that you'll see your loved ones again. Hope that you'll see Jesus again. The resurrection makes it possible. We can have a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. My friends, how are you responding to the message of resurrection? I don't know about you, but I worship. I thank God that He has caused me to be born again by His mercy. Not because of good things I've done, because I, I have my moments. I think we all do. And I'm thankful that I have something to look forward to, even in the midst of the dark days that we're in. We have hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your resurrection. Help us to have a proper response to your resurrection. Help us with the Apostle Peter to praise you for your resurrection. Father, if there's anyone here that is listening to my voice that does not know you as their personal Savior, I pray that they would trust you this morning they would turn to you for salvation and you will hear their cry because through the resurrection you have made it possible for them to be born again according to your mercy and father I pray that for those that feel that there's no hope would you give us hope your resurrection makes it possible that that you will come again and you will receive us to yourself that where we are you will be also father we know that the rest of the world has no hope but we do and i pray father that we would respond as the apostle peter did to the glorious resurrection of our lord and savior jesus christ we pray these things father in jesus name Amen.